The following program is brought to you in part by Northern States Power Company. Christmas in Hanoi, 1972. America unleashes a barrage on the capital of North Vietnam. The bombing, aimed at both the backs and the spirits of the people, is relentless, devastating, but in vain. A final chapter in the Vietnam War. population in Vietnam, long years after the war, any people who still can bear a grudge against the American people. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Good người. Lenin Peace Park in Hanoi. Vietnam's first generation to grow up without foreign domination, without war, sings the praises of their victorious hero, Ho Chi Minh. This is Vietnam today, patient, proud, hopeful, a nation at peace. This too is Vietnam, impoverished, depressed, ill-fed, ill-equipped, and ill at ease. Vietnam, a totalitarian society. There's no more freedom at all. No independence, no freedom. What did those people really win? I think they lost more than they won. They achieved a victory as they defined it, but of course at enormous cost. Vietnam, a people America so intimately, yet so brutally met. A battleground America never truly understood. Today, still divided, distant, and forgotten. Vietnam. It is indeed a word, a country many in America would just as soon forget. However, Vietnam the war, Vietnam the era, had such a profound impact on so many of us because after all, we watched that war from our own living room, from the comfort of our own homes, that it shall remain forever etched on the hearts and the minds of all Americans. An outpouring of books, Hollywood films, scholarly articles, a major documentary series, the unveiling of the massive Vietnam Veterans Memorial, along with our continuing interest in America's MIAs, POWs, and Amer Asian children, make Vietnam a country we can hardly ignore. What follows is not more history, analysis, or debate about Vietnam, right or wrong, but rather a rare and most recent foray through a country few of us have ever seen. A smattering of print journalists have toured Vietnam of late. We, however, obtained a 35-day visa, which the Vietnamese tell us is the most extensive tour ever granted an American film crew since the end of the war. What follows 
is the story of a system and a society far different from our own. The story of a people recovering from war as they pursue, for better or for worse, the path of communism. Our journey begins in just a moment. Rush hour in Hanoi, a 1930s French provincial city, frozen in time and quite literally an antique. It's a unique city. I mean, it's a city of bicycles and big trees, and it's a, a city of, of beautiful autumn sunshine. Uh, certainly this is a museum, and there isn't a great deal of, of uh, construction. Richard Bernowski is the Australian ambassador to Vietnam. The Australians, who fought alongside the Americans in Vietnam, have recently established diplomatic ties with Hanoi. Vietnam itself wishes to extend its own range of contacts with the world beyond the very narrow uh, set of uh, friends and, and allies it has at present. It's very important, and you can't ignore, as I said before, you can't ignore a country of 60 million people. Hanoi and the surrounding Red River Delta is one of the most densely populated areas in the world. This has been the seat of communist inspiration and ideals for more than 50 years. The people, mostly peasants, are grim, determined, and resigned to life in a socialist system. Most of them are not communists, i.e. members of the party, but most of them would feel uh, genuinely that the system of government they have here is the one that they want. So Wan An is vice chairman of the Vietnamese American Friendship Society based in Hanoi. Etc. An believes that the communist system uh, is one the they, people they, wholeheartedly they, they embrace. The they conceive as socialism in, in this uh, stage of uh, and the nation's history as patriotism. And patriotism and uh, the desire to, to build a, a, a prosperous country. Most of the people in the North live outside the major cities. Their lives have changed a little since the war. Once they worked for the French. Today they toil for the state. They are enterprising, though poor. Above all, they have endured. You see, in the history of mankind, no other country had to suffer so long and so heavy as Vietnam from foreign domination. We have had been 1,000 years under domination. In order to understand no Vietnam's Vietnam. troubles under a communist and system, under according to Foreign Minister and Nguyen Co Tak, one must remember Vietnam's unique legacy of exploitation and war. Much invasion. And the bloodiest war in the world, it is the uh, Nixon and Johnson war. And we have, we have paid so much our blood to our, for our independence. No country, no other country in the world have paid so much blood for its independence. Many parts of the North still bear the scars of war. Plants, roads, and particularly bridges are in dire need of repair. Here at Zoc Mew, an artillery base just south of the former demilitarized zone, it seems that America left only yesterday. This is a forbidden zone. Live ammunition remains strewn about. We proceeded only with the assistance of our guide, Tuan. Uh, even after 10 years in this area, still very dangerous, 
a lot of mice still left there and some kind of uh, bombs. And if you are not careful when you step on, very easy to step on mice and we may die here. Since the Vietnam War ended, an estimated five to 6,000 Vietnamese have been either killed or wounded as they stumble across live ammunition. Along Coastal Highway 1, tons of GI junk litter the landscape. As America withdrew from Vietnam, millions of dollars worth of military hardware was abandoned. Much of it simply left to rot. Here, in a Hanoi suburb, the wreckage of an American plane peers from a community pond. Bunkers, first built by the French and later used by the Americans, still stand today, testaments to a century of war. In all, an estimated three million people died during the war with the French and the U.S. More than half of the casualties were non-combatant civilians, and virtually everyone can claim a family member killed, wounded, or missing in action. Chúng tôi như thế là bom đến rào rào. Chúng tôi rất căm thù của giặc Mỹ. A bomb hit my house and it collapsed. No one died but five members of my family were injured. So we became very angry at the Americans and asked the world to put them on trial and destroy them to the end. Perhaps Vietnam's most lasting wounds of war are on full display here at Tuzu Hospital in Saigon. These are all deformed babies. We keep them for research purposes. As you see, some have cancer. The deformities are the result of poisons used by the Americans in Vietnam. The incidence of still and premature births, as well as birth defects in Vietnam is high, particularly in the South. Relative to other third world countries, birth defects and gynecological diseases are unusually high. Every year this ward is full. We have about 80 beds, and most are occupied with women who have cancers, of the cervix, of the ovaries, and so forth. The percentage of women with cancer in Vietnam is very high, and this, we believe, is because of defoliation. I think history will show that uh, this must have been one of the most uh, difficult and, uh, and toughest um, uh, challenges to the human spirit that, that uh, could have been imposed. Saigon, Hanoi's long-time antagonist to the South, is the former seat of both French and American influence and power. A westernized city where, in the past, people got raucous and rich. Today, Saigon is an occupied city. A virtual police state whose subdued population is constantly and carefully watched. If you're talking about the state and state surveillance, Vietnamese state surveillance, yes, of course, there's a strong element of that. There are violations of human rights. Uh, there, there's no uh, course of, of uh, justice as we know it. Uh, there, there is a certain degree of capriciousness in the law here. People are taken away without due process. These are Western systems of democracy and, and law that we respect. Uh, they don't necessarily, necessarily respect them here. Hanoi, of course, strongly distrusts Saigon and Southerners in general. The people, by and large, have hardly embraced the notion of working for the state.
And though the city officially bears his name, the majority of the people here remain at best indifferent to Ho Chi Minh. In the north, the allegiance to the state is more evident. A young guard who lost two brothers and a younger sister in the American bombing explains. Ho Chi Minh tried to solve the problems of our people, to bring happiness to Vietnam. He gained independence for us from the imperialists. We remember his teachings, and both myself and the people love him dearly. On any Sunday morning, some 15 to 20,000 people pass through Ho's tomb, where he lies in state. A building which is one of the few new construction projects completed since the war. The loyalties to Uncle Ho, however, are not entirely as deep-rooted as they may seem. These children, many of whom are the more privileged sons and daughters of party or government officers, sing only the official songs of the state. Their loyalties, in other words, are not only encouraged, they are taught. In the South, the disenchantment, the frustration is evident. I don't have anything for work in this case. Surface freedoms are scarce, and by administrative rule, people are forbidden to talk with foreigners. There's nothing for me work. This man, allowed to work only as a petty shopkeeper, risked an interview with us. I know people like that. Maybe in this case, can you help me? The, my father and my sister, who works many long time for the U.S. government and likes the U.S. government very much. But now we cannot go to there. I can, my, I can do many work with Americans, but now I cannot do for my government. As most Vietnam observers agree, Saigon remains the dominion of the Hanoi government. Hanoi has even disciplined or reassigned its own officials in Saigon while continuing to proclaim the national reunification and reconciliation. But if by national reconciliation you're talking about a burying of the hatchet, uh, that obviously has not taken place and I doubt that it will take place in the lifetime of Vietnamese now living. Dr. William Turley is a Vietnam scholar at the University of Southern Illinois. The Saigonese know that they're not trusted, and so they expect to be watched. And I think that uh, those factors contribute to a certain air of uh, tension uh, that one can feel in the streets of Saigon. The regime trusts the people more in the north than it does in the south. Uh, the northern population doesn't require very close uh, regulation to stay in line. Because my country have suffered so much of war. The country was divided. Every family is divided. Vietnam's foreign minister, Nguyen Co Tak. My dream is how to have enough food for the people, clothes for the people, medical care for the people, and education for all the children. The prosperity to which the Vietnamese communists aspire, however, remains an elusive dream. Yes, uh, they, live, they live here, um, and uh, they don't have any other place to live. She's, uh, she came into the city in 1980, and she's lived out on the streets uh, like this in various places since, since then. The average income in Vietnam is about $175 per year. The population is growing out of control. Tens of thousands are un- or underemployed, surviving any way they can. 
Uh, she, um, she gets uh, old refuse paper. She's a, a garbage collector, in other words. David Marr, a former U.S. Marine intelligence officer who served in Vietnam, is currently an historian with the Australian National University in Canberra. As a scholar, this is his third visit to Vietnam. There hasn't been a great deal of improvement uh, since, since the end of the war overall. If they don't manage to constrain their population growth, no, it won't do any good to uh, increase production. It'll all be eaten up by new mouths. Rampant inflation, approaching 100% a year, eats up the wages of low-paid workers. Rice, meats, sugar, cloth, even cooking oil are rationed. So that's almost a month's salary for the, uh, the uh, ordinary uh, state employee. They can't live on their salaries. They just can't do it. The people who are making money in Vietnam today uh, are those who sa have some little private scam or are able to use their official position for corrupt purposes. But people who try to live within the means given to them officially by the state can barely do it. Factories are producing at about 50% of capacity. Coal output is low, electricity in short supply. New power projects are far behind schedule. The government claims the literacy rate is high. Outside observers say just over half the people can read and write. Disease and malnutrition are common. Medicines in short supply. And on the average, the government spends $1 per person per year on health care. The average person in Vietnam, therefore, can expect to live just 47 years. In all, the quality of life in Vietnam today has actually fallen since the end of the war. I feel I'd like to lick their wounds and recover. Uh, they need things from the, the, the West, from the world, from the, the commercial marketplaces. They need money, they need aid, they need equipment, they need stimulation. I don't think uh, many Americans feel they have any obligation to Vietnam in terms of reparations, uh, in terms of paying the Vietnamese something for the pain uh, of the war. That's a reality. Here, you know, 10 years are torn by war. And 15 million tons of bombs dropped on, in my country. Twice the number of bombs dropped during the Second World War. So you, you can imagine how big, uh, what is the dimensions of our wounds of war. Uh, now, I don't think the Vietnamese government continue, can continue to blame uh, all their problems on the Americans and before them the French. Um, uh, they've got a, that, that's, that's a, um, a rationale that's going to run out of time uh, sooner or later. The war in Vietnam was a, was a mistake by the United States government and not the mistake of the Vietnamese. We are not to be blamed for what has been happening in the past. When the war wound up, many of them thought that uh, within a couple decades, Vietnam would have completed the initial stages of industrialization and be well on its way towards taking a place beside uh, the other industrialized nations of the communist uh, world. But that is just not going to happen. Vietnam is going to be a very, very poor country for a long time to come. The Mekong Delta, the richest and most productive region in all of Vietnam. Expansive and remote, this is a haven for pockets of resistance to communism. 
It is home for millions of poor peasants, many of whom openly shrug communist efforts to collectivize agriculture in the South. This is also home for To Um, a 14-year-old Amerasian boy still living in Vietnam. The communists are not much different than the government they took over from. This is also the South, the American South, Titusville, Florida, home for Mike Shado, a Vietnam December veteran, and his 71. Vietnamese wife, T. It was difficult enough for me to get permission for my wife to leave with me. And we left our son with the grandparents. It is Michael's son, Tort Um, a full-fledged American citizen whom the Shadows have named Lance, who lives with his grandparents in the Mekong Delta. Her family was way down in the Mekong Delta, and a very poor family, and if you don't know anyone in Vietnam, you don't get anything done. All I want is just to have our son back. It's been a long time, and I still haven't seen him yet. Lance Shado is but one of an estimated 8 to 15,000 Amerasian children still lingering in Vietnam. The Shados, who left Lance behind because he was too ill to travel, have pleaded with the Vietnamese, not only for their son's release, but his grandparents as well. Thus far, they have had no response from the Vietnamese government. In Vietnam, being an Amerasian child has a, a social and racial stigma attached to it. I have to do everything I can. I'm sorry. For all of them. And uh, so that's where we are right now. Nowhere. We have nothing. We are sick, and I have asked my daughter to send us money. The Shadows say they have sent money to their family in the Delta, both to support them and to pay the bribes they say are required to get Lance out. Most of the money has never been received. The Vietnamese officials with whom we inquired about the Shado case claim they have tried repeatedly to contact the family. Yes, uh, we have heard about them. Um, actually, we, um, we have seen this family on the special list given to us by the American authorities. They also claim the government does not open mail and take money. They emphatically deny there are any required bribes and payoffs. If they could have the money to pay off the officials, there would be no problem for the exit visas, there would be no problem for the paperwork to get up to Ho Chi Minh City and get on an airplane and leave. But if you're from a, a poor peasant family, nobody has the time for you. And he, my son wrote a letter for me and I cry a lot, you know. He said, it really hurt. My family hurt very much, too. When I get him, how old is he going to be? 16, 17, 18, 19, 20? What chance is he really going to have for an education or an opportunity in life over here now? Let alone someone who has to learn a whole new culture, a whole new language. And they don't want him. They don't want Amerasian people. They want nothing left to remind them of the war. I've already lost so many years with them. And I'm going to get someone that I really don't even know. In Da Nang, where there are many Amerasians, this family is not as fortunate as Lant Shado. They have not heard from their father for more than six years. Few American GIs acknowledge the children they left behind. 
For me, America does not matter so much, but their father has obligations, obligations to take them and care for them, for their schooling and so forth. Here I can only do my best, but it is too difficult for me to take care of this big a family. This woman has five Amerasian children. Her youngest son is Randy. I want to go live with my father, but my mother has to work hard and has to stay here to take care of the others. Otherwise, she would like to go to America with my father. Both the Vietnamese and American governments have discussed the Amerasian issue on several recent occasions. The Vietnamese say all Amerasians may leave at any time. The U.S. has agreed to accept them. Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs, Dr. Paul Wolfowitz. And we've made it clear we'd like to permit them to come to the United States and through something called the Orderly Departure Program that the U.N. runs, we have been able to get out roughly 3,500 of these children and their families so far. We prepared to take them all in, a, in an orderly way. We think that uh, presently the American authorities uh, are solving this problem uh, too slow and uh, the number they accept is too li uh, limited. We have the feeling that that issue is basically resolved and that the Vietnamese understand why we have to take these people through the orderly departure program they understand that we've made extra room in that program to accommodate, I think it's 10,000 over the next two years, uh, and we're not close to that rate of processing yet. The gap between rhetoric and reality on both sides remains wide. Bureaucratic delays and red tape seem endless. Randy in Da Nang will probably never know his father. Lance Shado is now a young teenager. With no school to attend, he can only learn the life of a peasant farmer. There's no more freedom at all. No independence, no freedom. And hard life, miserable life. That's why people have to leave the country. One of these days, I wished I could see my family all over here. That's my last dream. I would like to be with my husband over there, so I can stay home with him and take care of the family. It is my dream to spend my life in a home with my husband and children. Da Nang is home for Nguyen Thai Von, a mother of four and former bookkeeper for the Americans. She and her family have officially applied to leave Vietnam. Von's husband, Phan Bong, lives and works in the American heartland. A former officer with the South Vietnamese Army, he stayed behind in 1975, reluctant but willing to work with the communists. He was instead imprisoned at hard labor for four years. He nearly died, but eventually escaped by boat. I escaped because I, I don't think I can stay in the camp forever and ever. I think in my mind bef before I do that, I think that I better die out the ocean better than I die in the prison camp. How, how do you do? How do you do? How do you do? Vaughn is but one of the more than half a million Vietnamese who have officially applied to leave Vietnam. Good morning, Peter. Peter. Because she has asked to go, she no longer receives her government ration privileges. Vaughn survives on whatever her husband can send her. They're very poor. Nobody's starving, but very poor. I think that uh, the life for my wife and children is come kind of harder if I'm not there. Uh, but for suppose if now I'm home, 
I cannot do nothing for them because I don't have a job. I don't have nothing to do. And sooner or later, they send me to NEZ. Had Fawn been released from forced labor, he and his family would likely have been sent here to a new economic zone, or NEZ. NEZs are planned agricultural communities, sometimes constructed to reclaim defoliated land. More than a million people have been sent to NEZs, many displaced persons who lost their homes and villages during the war. Others come from the ranks of the unemployed. They are so-called war criminals. They are assigned to work here. The government calls them volunteers. People uh, were simply rounded up on trucks and taken out to the countryside and deposited next to the road with a scrap of barbed wire and a hoe and said, uh, till your field. Of course, that was not adequate preparation of the site and uh, people very soon, as soon as they could, made their way back to Saigon. On the day we visited this NEZ, guards with automatic weapons patrolled work areas. We asked the director of this work zone why so many people have tried to escape. You see, many of the people brought here from the cities did service work for the old government, for the Americans. They had good jobs or did illegal things. They earned an easy living, and now they resist our socialist plans for a better life. They like entertainment more than they like having to work hard for a living. New economic zones have produced mixed results. Some are productive. Others are located in areas with poor soil. Many are mismanaged, and few have met their production quotas. Some people, mostly displaced peasants, have embraced their new homes. But generally, it would be, I think, accurate to say that the concept of a new economic zone has not been a sensationally popular thing in Vietnam, and they themselves freely admit this. This is Viet Duc Bui. College educated in the U.S., Viet returned to Vietnam in 1971. Neither a government nor a military official, he became a man caught in the middle of America's war. When it ended, he was suspect, not permitted to work. He too left by boat in 79. It's very difficult to make the decision to leave my family. I know that. And uh, I remember it was a rainy day. I um, was informed that uh, the trip is ready if I wanted to go. So um, I went with my wife. And uh, I remember, I look at the two boys. They were so young, five years old and three and a half years old. They didn't know what was going on. So. Um, I took a bike and carried my wife to a post office in Saigon and uh, some people picked me up and, uh, and that was the last time I saw my family. We were surely that we were very sad and we always uh, expect that we can join, my, I can take my children to join her, their father soon, as soon as possible. Viet's wife, An, lives with her sons in Saigon. She would spend most of her time taking care of the boys. That's what I want. I worry whether, that, whether it, it is feasible in my lifetime that I will be able to see my family again or not. My wife is very religious. She believes strongly in Buddhism. 
The Vietnamese government encourages atheism. The majority of the Vietnamese people, however, are Buddhists. The government regards monks as unproductive and potentially dissident free thinkers. Few new monks, as well as Catholic priests, have been allowed to heed their respective callings since the occupation of the South. I think my wife is becoming more and more religious because religion would provide her the most relief and the most philosophical way of life for her to struggle through life. But I realized that to cope with the emotions and problems that my family as well as myself are having, we have to be very patient and we have to have faith that eventually our family will be reunified. And that's what we are praying for and hoping for. More than one million people have already left Vietnam. Those who remain or resist relocation to economic zones jam an already overcrowded and sullen Saigon. Others crowd the many rivers that snake through Saigon. Boat people with no place to go. In Da Nang, Phan's wife Phan idly awaits permission to leave. Permission that may well never come. Viet's wife, An, can only continue her five-year-long vigil. For its part, the Vietnamese government has granted 30,000 exit permits, but the U.S. will accept only about 1,200 Vietnamese per month. So the process of orderly departure, of family reconciliation, is both painful and slow. Those permitted to leave are those against whom the communists bear no grudge. Those for whom the communists have no room or no use within their system. For the communist North Vietnamese, the memories, the echoes of war have yet to fade away. An air raid siren is still used to mark the noon hour in Hanoi. Along Vietnam's remote northern border with China, we came across a citizen's militia preparing for what they regard as the inevitable, an invasion from China. This citizen's militia, who are otherwise simple hill tribe peasants, formed Vietnam's first line of defense. An ancient foe China did, in fact, invade Vietnam in 1979 and still occupies territory within the country. And between Vietnam and China, we are in a state of a war. And now they are still threatening my country and Southeast Asia. They, are, they, are not, they, they do not stop their policy of, uh, of uh, expansionism. They are seen occupying a territory of India of Vietnam, you see. 
Vietnam's historic and recently rekindled tensions with China have in part led to the buildup of a massive though inexperienced army. We encountered these recruits in training near the China border. Together with the militia, they form a force of more than a million men, the fourth largest standing army in the world. But if you were to ask, does it need those men to defend itself? Is the military threat to its uh, security so real and so great that it really needs all these men under arms? I suppose the answer is no. In addition to its size, Vietnam's army is also costly soaking up more than half the national budget, as well as the best and the brightest from Vietnam's technical schools. The army also has political clout. A fourth of the Politburo and nearly one third of the Central Committee are military officers. New members of the party also tend to come from the military. General Huang Fang is the division commander who fought both the French and the Americans. When the Vietnam War ended, we began to rebuild. We had many, many difficulties, housing, transportation, and so forth. But now China is waging war. So once again, our strategic task is to be ready to defend the country. Military leaders themselves have noted that uh, this, uh, there's a drain on the civilian sector, and it can only uh, hurt them over the long run. Vietnam is also deeply entrenched militarily here in Kampuchea, where it claims to have liberated the Kampuchean people from the horrors of the genocidal Pol Pot regime. In the late 1970s, Pol Pot, the communist leader of the Khmer Rouge, imprisoned and tortured thousands of his own people. In all, Pol Pot massacred an estimated two to three million Kampucheans. He buried many of them in a mass grave outside Phnom Penh. The Vietnamese maintain a massive army here. They claim to protect the Kampucheans from another invasion and potential massacre by Pol Pot whose troops lurk along the Thai-Cambodian border. We have saved the Cambodian people from the, from the genocide. So we are there to help the Cambodian people. And uh, you know, now they are still the danger of coming back of Pol Pot. Most Western nations have condemned Vietnam for what they call an invasion and occupation of Kampuchea. It's the Vietnamese who are trying to rule Cambodians. And it's ironic that for all of the Vietnamese talk about nationalism and independence, it's they who are suppressing the independent nationhood of another country. They're much more afraid of Pol Pot than they are of the Vietnamese, and they're put up with the irritation of having an occupying army uh, in there, so long as there's the threat of Pol Pot. Vietnam's military presence in Kampuchea continues to alienate the United States. The Vietnamese, therefore, remain totally dependent upon the Soviet Union. In addition to billions of dollars in aid, the Soviet bloc ships into Haiphong Harbor and other ports virtually all of Vietnam's fuel, military, and essential supplies. Vietnam is in hock to the Soviet Union for the next five or ten years. They look at it as a comradely relationship. This is the socialist system that they're, they're part of. 
but in almost the next breath, they will also say that they very much want to have relations with the capitalist system. I was uh, here in, in 1980, and there was much less uh, market activity at, the, at that time. Uh, it's really been in the last three or four years, I think, which it's, uh, it's blossomed or exploded, depending on what, uh, what, what word you want to use. If there is a new battleground in Vietnam today, it is in the marketplace. Reform-minded pragmatists within the Communist Party have begun a series of economic reforms, grudgingly allowing private trade on the free or open markets, especially in the South. Today, nearly three-fourths of all consumer goods are bought and sold on free markets. Dr. David Marr says such capitalist reforms have taken root here because the state-run economy is in a shambles. Well, they have to um, uh, rely on their, their wives to be out in the market like this. Um, they often, uh, their children can't go to school because they've got to be out trying to make something. Um, uh, after hours, they, um, especially if they've got a little bit of land uh, in the countryside, they'll be out there trying to grow something for themselves. Uh, there's a hundred different ways that they have to try and make a living. Though socialists at heart, Vietnamese party reformers, however loath to admit it, seem to be following the lead of China, which has of late tempered its highly centralized state-run economy. And adopted also Dr. William Vietnam. Turley. But the Chinese, as we have seen, have sort of given up on that idea. They said, well, you know, maybe we were wrong. And we've got to have a capitalist phase after all. Economic reforms also include incentive, bonus, and contract systems. Again, capitalist ideas. The productivity gains have been astounding. Two record grain harvests in a row. Vietnam is now on the verge of self-sufficiency in food production. Peasants may now sell their surpluses on the free markets. People have just a little bit more in their tummies, and that little bit is just enough more for them to feel positive about what's going on. In the north, there are private shops and stores as well. Though party purists fear what they call creeping capitalism. Often, or sometimes as a crackdown, uh, when there are perceptions of corruption and, and tax avoidance, not just here but in the south too, but uh, generally, the, the, the private sector won't disappear altogether. Most people in the North shop in state stores, often browsing at goods they can ill afford. Resentment toward private traders grows deep within the ranks of government workers. They see them creating opportunities for people in the private sector to make much more money than they, the state cadres, do. And they resent it. They say, you know, after all, we're the ones who fought and died for the revolution. And in the name of socialism, now you're going to permit capitalists <laughs> to make more money than we do? This is not fair. Aging hardline leaders continue to lose their grip here in Saigon. The Communist Party itself is actually losing members as well as favor with the people. Crackdowns are common. Nonetheless, export-import companies are thriving. Private traders continue to flourish. There has been change. Now the question is, how much of this activity we see in Ho Chi Minh City is froth, uh, and how much of it is um, some sort of is, is substantial growth or development? The current generation of leaders are going to die 
uh, before they see the Industrial Revolution really hit Vietnam, and I suspect that will be a grave disappointment to them. This could become a, a major center of activity in Southeast Asia, but it all depends on policy. Um, uh, I don't see it happening in the next 10 years, um, even with the best of policies. It looks like a dream, and I think my dream is modest. Within five or 10 years, we think the life in Vietnam would be better. And firstly, peaceful. We'll have peace. Vietnam remains one of the poorest nations on Earth. But Vietnam is a country exhausted as much by the problems of peace as by a legacy of war. The people of Vietnam, nonetheless, remain some of the most enterprising and enduring in all of Asia. Tragically, the system under which they toil remains repressive. If there is hope for Vietnam, it lies with the people. Given a chance to live and work more freely, Vietnam will enjoy both independence and prosperity. If the people remain stifled, fearful, and controlled, the cry of victory in Vietnam will forever have a hollow ring.